Hi guys, welcome to HOB TV. This is episode 9. We first want to start off by thanking those that have subscribed, those that are tuning in, those that are commenting, liking our pictures, and also disliking our pictures. We want to thank you guys for tuning on in. And for those that are watching for the first time, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Stay tuned with us while we break down boxing for you guys. Okay, I'm real excited for today's show. We got a great episode today. We, we have a special guest today. Real good special guest today that we're that's going to be coming on later in the show. But before we go on with that, we're going to talk about this past weekend's fight. Porter Ugas, Bivol Smith. Uh, so, Steve, what did we learn this week? Well, David, we learned that, first of all, we learned that if you see Conor McGregor in public, you better not ask him for a picture because he might just break your phone and your face. Oh, but, but more importantly, I learned that Porter versus Ugas was not a robbery. Once again, Porter versus Ugas was not a robbery. A very close fight, yes. Robbery, no. Uh, could have gone either way. You know, last week here on episode eight, I predicted that Porter would win by decision. He won by split decision, but I actually scored at 115, 113 for your Dennis Ugas. I really liked his accuracy, his time to counters. Uh, he was making Porter pay at times for coming in recklessly. The only thing I felt he did wrong was that he started pretty slow. Uh, he was thinking a little bit too much in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sean Porter came in like, like a bull in a china yeah. shop, just rushing at the guy. And Jordana Sugas made him pay here and there, but it took him a while to get warmed up. Um, I really felt this fight came down to the final round. Neither guy really impressed me much. Neither guy really stole that yeah. round, but if I had to give it to somebody that last round, I gave it to Ugas. Um, now, why I think the judges scored the fight for Porter, um, he threw 66 more punches. You know, um, he only landed 14 more. But those 66, that effective aggressiveness, mm -hmm. uh, in the eyes of the judges, I believe uh, he won the fight because of that. Now, you know, this Sean Porter, he's been in a lot of battles, okay? And you yeah. can tell. He looks sloppy at times. He uh, failed to make weight the first First, second time on the scale, he had yep. to cut his hair to make weight. Yeah, uh, David, uh, who would you like to see Sean Porter fight from here on? Do you think uh, uh, he's the same guy as he once was? A, a little wear and tear? Uh, who would you like to see him? I mean, there's plenty of guys you can go with. You can still go with Danny Garcia. Hey, why not? Uh, there's Earl Spence out there, you know. Yeah, there's also uh, Terrence Crawford. Why not? Right? That'll be an exciting fight. Yeah. Uh, Terrence Crawford versus Sean Porter. But to say he's 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 out of it just because this one fight, I really don't think so, man. I think what the important thing that we learned from this is that cutting weight sucks. You know. <laughs> so more, I mean, Fighters Maurice enemy, Hooker. Right? Maurice okay. Hooker had the same issue. Yeah. Sean Porter had the same issue. You can definitely tell in both their performances, even though they did come out with the win. I mean, they're champions, so they're definitely going to come out the win. So I mean, well, I can hey, see, any, well, I can see why Maurice Hooker would struggle. He's five eleven. Fighting at 140. Oh, yeah. Sean yeah. Porter is about 5'6", fighting yeah. at 147. Yeah. So, shouldn't really have those issues, but he is a little older. He's but been he, he is older, game. and he has a bigger body frame. He's he short does. and stocky, dude. And let's not forget, he fought in the amateurs at 165. He did. So, he, did. he fought at a way high, higher weight level, and for him yeah. to come from I remember watching him fight. It definitely hurts. Way bigger guys here about 10 years ago at the, at the sports ring. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Against that Mexico duel, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. That was a good card. Um, you know, with Sean Porter, I'd like to see a Thurman rematch. Yeah. You know, both of them uh, didn't seem right in their last fights. Mm -hmm. First fight was really exciting. Uh, I'd like to see that again. Yeah, that'll definitely be an exciting fight. I would want to see it too. Yeah. Well, we mentioned uh, Mighty Mo, Maurice Hooker. Yep. Uh, he made the second defense of his junior welterweight title yep. against Mikel Lespierre. A cruise to an easy victory, unanimous decision, improved his record to 26 and 0. Yep. Now, David, you're familiar with Hooker having yeah. sparred him here at the HOB, House of Boxing. Yep. How do you think he does against Jose Ramirez? And how do you think he does at welterweight? You know, we mentioned he's a bigger guy. Yeah. If he does make that move up, how do you like that? Well, he's, like you said, man, he's naturally a big guy. So going to 147, I think, wouldn't be a bad move. But there's definitely a lot of competition at that weight level. I think what he wants to do right now is he wants to unify the belts at 140. He definitely wants to control that 140 division. And to do that, he would need to face Jose Ramirez. And that would be an explosive fight for me, man. I mean, I definitely yeah. would want to see it. Ramir I mean, uh, Ramirez, yeah, Ramirez is a, is a tough fighter. But uh, Hooker is as well, man. And, I mean, he's proved it. He's proved it in his past few fights. And last fight, um, this past Saturday, 
Uh, you can definitely tell the weight, cutting the weight had an issue. And I mean, at the end of the day, he fessed up that he did some stuff wrong with, with, his, with his nutrition and cutting the weight. He weighed to the last minute. So, I mean, but at the end of the day, he won the fight. Right, yeah, he amazing. boxed. He boxed at twelve rounds. Nice. He used his jab, boxing the whole twelve rounds too. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't get me wrong. He got a little tired, but that was that was gonna come with him cutting the weight. So I give him all the credit for getting uh, defending defending the belt. But I would definitely want to see Ramirez fight now. For that fight, I mean, I don't know who would win it. Okay. It's one of those fights. Hey, it was it would be pretty close, yeah. but. Uh, I don't know. I would want to see that fight, though. That's definitely yeah. a fight people want to see. It's definitely a contrast of styles. Ramirez's yeah. uh, volume against mm -hmm. Hooker's, uh, you know, boxing length. skills yeah. and length. Um, but, yeah, let's break down the, the Bibble fight. You know, what, what do you think of that fight? How, how do you oh, like man. Bibble moving forward? He showed a yeah. little bit more defensive prowess in this fight. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these European fighters, man, I mean, they use the jab. They're real basic, right? They'll jab, one-two, mm -hmm. one-two hook. Just and they'll, they'll step out. That, yeah. And they have power, yeah. So they'll step back. And then they'll, they'll just control him with the jab, throw the right hand. I mean, it was a good fight. Uh, and, I mean, he won. He won. But I was hoping to see an impressive win. Mm -hmm. uh, and he didn't do that for me. I mean, he's good. He's definitely a world champion. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how he, how he continues his career. He got stunned a little bit, I, I believe, yeah. in the fourth round. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let's face it, he did dominate that fight. Yeah, he, he did. Well. He did. Now, to recap a story that we talked about on Episode 8, Triple G formally announced... His partnership with the zone has begun. Yep. Uh, a couple of takeaways from that press conference. That's uh, pretty uneventful, first of all, you know. But uh, a couple of things I took away was that he decided to speak uh, just in, in his native uh, Russian language for the whole time. Yeah. He seemed about business real serious. Yeah. Um, there was no Mexican style references, no big drama show references. Yeah. He left those catchphrases at home or in yeah. Kazakhstan. Uh, so we see a little bit more, more uh, different, more. Uh, Serious tone Triple G here. Yeah. Um, one big thing I took away was that Abel Sanchez mentioned that win or lose, if Canelo wins or loses, either way, that Triple G wants him next, you know. So he doesn't want Danny Jacobs. If Danny Jacobs wins, he wants Canelo. So, yeah. you know, he's real serious. He's demanding Canelo in this, the next fight after this tune-up in June. Yeah. What do you think about that? What do you think of his tone, first of all? What do you think of okay, that I, I think I think it was a good tone, man. You could, it, this tone definitely showed that he was in control, right? He doesn't have his, his uh, longtime manager yeah. with him. Tom Lofer. So Tom Lofer, he doesn't have him with him for this uh, this uh, with this thing with his own. Uh, but I think he's he's definitely in control, man. He wanted to speak in Kazakhstan. Maybe Lofer wanted him to speak English those other times, you know. But now he's like, hey, he wants to be comfortable. Uh, and I'm not sure with him fighting Canelo, maybe he thinks he's getting older, you would think. He wants him now, so, so why not? <laughs> I think he has revenge on his mind. Uh, a guy mm -hmm. like Triple G, yeah, that loss had to do something to him mentally. It had to break him down mentally. It's probably killed him. Uh, you know, all these months he had time to think. I really yeah. think he, I really think he's eager to get Canelo back in the ring for that third mm -hmm. fight. And now, who do you think his first fight will be with? Oh man, TBA. That's who's going to be against uh, to be announced. <laughs> the, the always dreaded TBA. Yeah. Um, no, there's no signs of who who will it yeah. be. If you look at 160, uh, the fighters uh, with the zone, it's yeah. a real, real shallow pool of, mm -hmm. of guys who he could come up with. It's probably going to be some European guy that yeah, we never yeah. heard of. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, moving on, David is, is finally here. Garcia versus Spence. We're on the eve of the big fight. Yep. The home stretch. It's like Christmas Eve for us, right? It Any is, big it fight is. is like Christmas Eve for us. David, what are your final thoughts on this big fight? And whom or what will you be looking for on the undercard, stacked undercard? I mean, I'm looking for it to be an explosive fight, man. I mean, it's, it's one of those fights where we all have questions, and the only way they're going to be answered is come fight night this Saturday, right? Exactly. We all have different predictions. We might have oh, well, we have Garcia. the same predictions. Yeah, we might have people outbox. But I mean, I I could see Mikey Garcia outboxing Spence. Don't be surprised if that happens. But like I said, for it for all these questions to be answered, it's going to happen Saturday, and it's it's up to you guys to order it. Maybe you, Steve, order it and I'll go to your house. How about that? <laughs> so, man. so we'll see, man. We'll see. In, uh... yeah. so we'll see. It's going to be a great fight, man. And it's a pretty good undercard. I've seen Jay Leon Love and uh, Benavidez getting at it, getting at each other in yeah. the press conference. So, I mean, that, that'll be an exciting fight. 
So it's, then Nettie's on the card, a mm-hmm. uh, local here from Tijuana, another world champion. That'll be He's always an exciting fighter, so it'll be a good stack card, man. Yeah, I mean, we're both excited for it. But, you know, I, I'm always being asked by the boxing naysayers, well, who's next? Who, who are the young guys coming next? We never hear about the young fighters. Yeah. So you're going to see two young fighters in their prime, undefeated fighters in the main event, putting it on the line. Somebody's oh got to go. Yep. As I mentioned last week, this fight is just as big as Canelo Jacobs, more meaningful pound for pound wise. Uh, as of yesterday, yeah. this fight had sold 35,000 tickets at Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Uh, I'm expecting it to sell between 45 and 47,000 uh, night of the fight. Now, attendance wise, uh, Manny Pacquiao did 40,000 in his fight versus Antonio Margarito, did around 50,000 in his fight versus Joshua Clotty. Uh, for Dallas Cowboys, a boxing event, I believe that fight versus Clotty is, is number one. So Garcia Spence will challenge that spot attendance-wise. It's going to be a big, massive success all the way around. Yeah. Uh, Mikey Garcia's confidence is at an all-time high right now. Um, so we're going to see, you know, if he's biting off more than he could chew with this fight yeah. or if that confidence is warranted, you know. Yeah, All exactly. our questions will be answered, right? Yeah. Now, as far as what I'm looking for, an undercard, we got four prominent Mexican fighters on the card. Um, I believe Lu- Luis Neri from, from TJ is going to yep. have the most explosive fight. Mm-hmm. Um, J. Leon Love, uh, Benavides is going to be the most competitive fight. Benavides wants to fight Caleb Plant after this one. Yeah. So we're going to get to scout him a little bit, see, we'll exactly. see how he would yeah. fare against Caleb Plant. But I'm really going to look to see Chris Areola, man, the old man, yep. 38 years of age, the oldest man on the card. Yeah. You know, he's the grandfather now. Imagine. But, uh, you know, when I wrote for La Prensa San Diego here, the newspaper, man, I covered Chris Areola extensively. His plight to become the first Mexican heavyweight champion, we, we covered that. It was a joy talking to him. So I'm eager to see if the old man still has it, man. And, and, you know, props to him for coming back to the sport after, what, two years off? Yeah, I believe and, so. And wanting to, uh, you know, further that goal of becoming the first Mexican heavyweight champion. Of course. Right. Now it's time for our special guest. It is. Right. First special guest here on HOB TV. We're very excited. Right. Now throughout boxing history, cut men such as Chuck Bodak. Remember Chuck Bodak? I, of course. He used to tape those uh, pictures yeah, on his head. Yep. And you know, Chuck Bodak had a Fiat and he used to tape fighters' pictures on his Fiat. Damn. Ring magazine Legend. covers, all that stuff. Legendary. Legend. Uh, so, so legendary cut men such as Chuck Bodak and Rafael Garcia have played an integral part of a boxer's career, responsible for treating the most gruesome of cuts. Their work is vital in getting a fighter through the most grueling of fights. Now, we're now pleased to have with us Juan Cutman for Hire, Ramirez, to talk about his 14-year career in the sport. Welcome here, guys. Juan, come on, man. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Likewise. So we're excited, man. We're excited. So talking about Juan Ramirez and his Cutman for Hire. So uh, this upcoming weekend, we can catch... Mm -hmm. Cut man for hire on both main event corners, on Spence's corner and on Mikey Garcia's corner. What do you think about that fight? Well, it's an honor to be in such a big fight, you exactly. know. So to have Cut man for hire supplies in the corner of uh, Mikey Garcia and Errol Spence, it's like I said, it's an honor, and um, you know we wish them both the best. Yeah. I mean, they support uh, our brand, and we support them. So we hope it's an exciting fight, that they both come out healthy, yeah. and nothing but, um, you know, respect to both of them. Yeah. Juan, yeah. talk about uh, how you got uh, your start in the sport, mm-hmm. um, who you've worked with. Uh, touch a little bit on that. My start happened back in uh, 2004, 2005, and it started off, a lot of guys ask me this question, guys that are starting in the business. Um, and it's funny to say that you mentioned 14 years in the business, I didn't even know how many years I've been in the business. <laughs> but um, I guess when you're having fun, you don't even care about yeah. time. Uh, I started off by just walking into a gym, like House of Boxing. And um, it was, this was at Ultimate Fitness in Chula Vista. And I just walked in and, and talked to the coach, uh, uh, Coach Amador, and said, you know what, I want to be a cut man. Do you mind if I come in and uh, if any of your guys get hurt, I, I want to be there for them. That was my start. Uh, they were linked up with... Uh, when Ken Shamrock had his uh, school here in Chula Vista. Oh, the Lions Den. The Lions Den. When Lions Den was here, a lot of guys branched out of that, so uh, uh, Norbert Amador was one of the guys. And so they had guys, uh, 
fighting. My first fight, I believe, was at King of the Cage at Saboba Casino. Mm -hmm. And it was with Zach Taylor. And, um, you know, it was one of those things that surreal for me to walk out there. The arena seemed huge, humongous. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But that was my first fight. And that's how I started in the business. Man, yeah. so, I mean, you're talking about this experience and stuff like that. Now... How, how does someone get training in cut, man? I mean, how do you train? I mean, you just go to the gym and just hop on in the ring? This is one of the, one of the professions where you got to be in the trenches. Yeah. You can be a doctor, a nurse, you can be any of those, but if you can't handle the pressure of that corner, those 60 seconds of chaos at times, if you can't handle that, you could be the best surgeon, the best, yeah. and you won't be able to do it. So you need a, a person that's calm. There. Get in there, get to work, experience. The more corners you work, the more you see, then it's nothing new for you no more. You know, once that blood starts pouring, yeah. you know it's like a fireman going to the fire. Yeah. You know what you got to do. You got to go in there and do it. So that's how you start. I took some first responder classes, yeah, yeah. first aid, the basic stuff, mm -hmm. but everything else you learn being in that corner yeah. um, and, and doing the work. Yeah. Well, now your work has appeared in some motion pictures. Uh, let us know some motion pictures your work has appeared in, and, and how did that come to be? Uh, well, the biggest, uh, I would say the biggest motion picture was uh, South, uh, Southpaw. So uh, our supplies, our wristband, which is actually one of the ones that I'm wearing, yeah. uh, was featured in Southpaw. And there's been another, uh, other films, I believe a film out in, in Canada used our supplies. But it was one of those things, you know, they, they ordered. I asked, you know what, you're ordering a lot of things, you know, what, what's going on? Oh, we're filming a movie out in, I think it was Pittsburgh, and um, uh, we're filming a movie, and that's it. You know, I didn't ask anything else. Later on, I had friends out in the East Coast yeah. that contacted me and said, you know what, we're filming a movie in our gym, and we're using your supplies. So I was like, wow, you know, what a, what a blessing. It was huge. I mean, the movie turned out, you know, great. It was oh, yeah, a blockbuster. James Gyllenhaal. So, uh, yeah, Whitaker, uh, you know, uh, award-winning actor, mm -hmm. using the wristband. Yeah, I was mentioning great. to David the wristband went on auction. Yeah, oh, you know, man. so something that was made <laughs> in Chula Vista. Yeah, you know, went to oh, Pittsburgh, nice. all over the place, worn by uh, Forrest Whitaker, and um, used in the movie, and ended up in somebody's, you know, uh, living room or something yeah. display. Okay, now go ahead and talk to us about some professional boxing coaches that use. The cut man for higher wristband, because I mean, I see that cut yeah. man for wristband everywhere, man. I mean, like I said, you can see it this upcoming weekend on the two main event cards. And it's it's so many to mention, but I know we're gonna see it this weekend with yeah. uh, Robert Garcia, yeah. which I'm very grateful that he uses our supplies, our wristband. Uh, Dr. Anderson, which is a, a part uh, team Garcia, it's gonna be with Errol Spence, uh, cut man Jovi Arreal. Uh, we got cut men out of Texas. We got support worldwide. Yeah. And maybe it's because, well, number one, we put a lot of pride in our, in our supplies. We're in the mix. Uh, myself, uh, my partner, Stitch, we're both in the mix of things. So we know what's, uh, what it, you, what's useful in that corner, and we know what we need, our supplies that we need to work that corner. So I think that makes a difference, and um, that's why so many corners like uh, Canelo, uh, yeah. corner. You'll see it in his corner. Yeah. You'll see it in um, in Munguia's corner. Some of uh, you'll see it in a lot of the top champions. Yeah. Uh, uh, Maurice Hooker, which you mentioned, yeah. they use our supply. So, if the champions are using it, yeah. then you know There's we got something yeah. something good out there. Exactly. Brand brand of champions coming. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Uh, Juan, uh, you you have ties to a local legend mm -hmm. here, um, the greatest, in my opinion, the greatest San Diego Charger of all time. Number 55, Junior Sale. Talk about your experiences with the, with the late legend. Yeah, and it was an honor to work with him. Uh, back, I believe, it was 2009. They were doing the pilot for uh, sports, jo sports jobs with Junior Sale. So I got a call from Dan Henderson's gym out in Temecula. They said, we need a cut, man. We're doing a segment on the fight game. You know, what goes on in that corner from uh, the fighter, the head coach, the cut, man. So I got an opportunity to work with Junior out in um, Temecula. And um, just showing him what it is that we do in that yeah. corner. And Junior was, uh, you know, he was pleasant to work with. I was actually really nervous. I mean, here's yeah. Junior. I seen him. I mean, I would too. You know, <laughs> yeah. I seen him, uh, you know, yeah. a big guy. But yeah. he was a, a gentleman. Uh, treated everybody, the crew, with respect. Uh, treated myself. He said, you know what? Cut man, don't be nervous. 
<laughs> just be yourself and let, let's talk. Let's talk about what you do. So nice. uh, we got to do that. We got to work um, work with on that show, and um, they they picked up the pilot. So yeah. we must have done a good job, yeah, you know, showing right. them what what to do. And uh, the yeah. verses picked yeah. up that pilot. So it was awesome. Um, now you worked the corner. You would go on to work the corner of Junior Seau's son, right? Junior Seau's son um, did a stint in the MMA. Yes. Uh, tell us about that. Talk about. Yeah, well, I was working a fight a few years back out in um, in uh, Saquon. I believe it was Saquon Casino, and uh, one of the coaches tells me, "You know what? Uh, I think it was uh, I forget the the gym right now. I'm not I'm not gonna mess up the name, but <laughs> anyways, it was a real real well respected gym, MMA yeah. gym out in East County." He said, I got five fighters fighting, and one of them happened to be his son. So, you know, it was, I got to wrap his hands uh, yeah. for the fight workers' mm. corner, and I got to let him know, you know what, I got to work with your dad. You know, he was a, a you know, good, good person to work with, and it's yeah. an honor to get to work with you as well. It's a great so story. that was a, it was a good move, one of those moments in time that, you know, are priceless. Special, special. Yeah, special moments. Nice. Now, Juan, uh, I'm going to show, we're going to have a little fun with Juan. I'm going to show you three pretty gruesome cuts here. Okay. Yeah, now you sure. tell us the steps you would take in between rounds to uh, help prevent further damage to these cuts, right? The first cut has been described as one of the worst cuts in boxing history. Badu Jack required 25 stitches for this cut right here against uh, Marcus Brown on the Manny Pacquiao Broner undercard. You see him right here. It happened in the sixth round. He continued fighting. He was a bloody mess. Juan, how would you go about fixing this cut right? Yeah, and that's one of the cuts that, um, I, like I was mentioning to you guys before uh, the show, I got my start in MMA, uh, kickboxing, uh, Muay Thai. So uh, that's one of those cuts you see a lot from an elbow. Maybe, an, you know, somebody gets caught with an elbow in, in Muay Thai. That's what you see, and I've seen it. Uh, the number one thing, stay calm. Clean it up. You know, clean that cut up. Uh, show, have your presence there so that the doctor, the corner, the referee knows, you know what, we got this. This is going to be fine. And clean it up and pack that thing in. A lot of times, cut men get super, you know, they get on the superficial. They, you know, they want to go, you know, light on you. No, that's one of those cuts where you got to pack in that, that swab, that gauze, get it in there with that medication and fill that up. Use up all the time you can and get a few seconds, put some Vaseline on it. Nice. Second cut, Juan. Have, have you guys ever had a splitting earache? Oh, no. <laughs> 2017 um, against Francisco Vargas, a splitting earache right here. This is actually That's uh, nice. caused by a butt right here, the headbutt right here. Juan, how would you go about, uh, this, this year is cut in half pretty much. Pretty much how yeah. would you go about fixing this cut right uh, here? You know what, clean it up, pressure. Get your medication on it. You know, that's about it. Um, yeah. You see a lot of those things, I guess, in uh, like in jiu-jitsu, wrestlers, you know, things like that. Or, or that, Mike Tyson. That, yeah. Or, or yeah. Mike Tyson. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's from or, a fight. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, that'd be it, you know. And those are things that sometimes you don't see. They're not that common. Yeah. But just, you know, letting the fighter know, you know what? Don't worry about this. We got this. You yeah. know? Uh, Steven Smith right here. The fight had to be stopped. Francisco Vargas would go on to win that fight. Now, Cutman, ha have you ever had to stop a baby head from growing from somebody's head? Um, <laughs> a hematoma right here. Hasim Rotman back in 2002 against Evander Holyfield. Baby head growing out. Juan, how would you go about fixing yeah, uh, this, he this hematoma? How do you go about hematomas? Huge mouse. I mean, one thing that I, we usually do when, uh, and when we're going to fight, we start seeing those hematomas forming. We like to do a lot of preventive. Get that ice on there before, before, you know. But once it happens, you know, just keep icing it. Ice on it, pressure, ice on it, pressure. That's all you can do. And, um, is but... There, is there any, any lasting effects after the fight from something No, like I mean, sometimes you get those things because maybe there's a broken, you know, you get those on the orbitals. Maybe they broke the orbital, so you're getting a lot of swelling and all that. There's not much you can do at that point. Uh, during the fight, just try to control it as much as you can. And if it is not affecting uh, his vision, yeah. then you're okay, you know. It should be fine. One uh, the most important question here mm -hmm. is if one night me and David get into something at machetes, could, could we call you late at night to come fix our cuts? Yeah. <laughs> if something goes down, can we do that? That's right, man. Like like we were mentioning earlier, you know, bloody face, no problem. Right. And I'm always ready. <laughs> so we got go. the we got the wristband, the swab, so I got you both of you guys. Juan, it's been a pleasure, man. You have some great stories. Thank, Thank you for Steve. being our first guest on HOBT. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. So make sure you guys stay tuned for next week's episode. And if you guys haven't watched, 
episode 7 or episode 8. Make sure you guys tune in and watch those again. So thank you guys for, for tuning on in. And thanks, Juan, for having, being our first guest. Yeah, thanks it's an guest. honor. See you guys next thanks. time.